imagine you've been driving for 15 hours in a race in the center of France. It's 1938 and the sun is beginning to come up but it's still fairly foggy. You can sense the fact that victory could be yours if you just hold on. The car that you would have been driving was a Delahaye 135. Not this Delahaye 135 that I'm in today, but one that is its direct descendant. It's extraordinary to think of the fact that this 1951 Delahaye 135 Chaperon Cabriolet is directly descended from the winner of the 1938 24 Hour of Le Mans. It would be as if today in 2020, I was driving along the street here in Newport, Rhode Island in the street version or a street version of the Peugeot that won Le Mans in 2007. Hardly conceivable. Now, of course, World War II did intervene between 1938 and uh, 1951, but nevertheless, the Delahaye 135 was sophisticated enough to still be competitive in racing after World War II into the early 1950s. Of course, the French really developed the car industry at its start. And this company, Delahaye, was founded by Emile Delahaye, who built his first car in 1894. Delahaye, unfortunately, died quite young in 1901, but by the time he died, Delahaye had already proven its success in competition in the then grueling city-to-city -city races that were typical at the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. The company stopped racing after the death of Emile Delahaye and didn't go back to racing until the mid-1930s when it started with rallies and hill climbs. And it's quite interesting that it went back into racing in a time when racing was starting to be dominated by both the Italian teams, Alfa Romeo in particular, and the Germans with Mercedes and Auto Union. By the time we get to the late 1930s, national pride was something that was in evidence everywhere in the racing scene. To think of driving what the French call a grand routier, uh, the Italians call it Gran Turismo, a car made for covering great distances, comfortably, quietly, efficiently, and yet is capable of winning races. It's something that's very special and at the heart of why we're driving this car today. Because this car will be one of the featured cars in our upcoming exhibition, From the Racetrack to the Opera, Marks That Did It All. There'll be great pairs of cars, including this Delahaye and the actual Delahaye 135 GP car that won the Le Mans race in 1938. It's hard to imagine sitting here on this very comfortable leather seat, surrounded by this beautiful burled wood and this wonderfully lined top, that this has the heart and soul of a racing car that Delahaye could indeed race on Sunday and sell on Monday is quite evident in the success that they had before World War II. There were two challenges to Delahaye's success after World War II. One was the fact that the largest market for a car like this would have been the United States. However, Delahaye lacked the funds that Alfa Romeo had, for instance, to develop their pre-war chassis to a post-war configuration that would be appealing to the American market. This is a wonderful, luxurious, comfortable, and fast car, but it feels very much like a pre-war car. By 1951, American buyers had other options at this incredible price range. So it was very, very difficult, although they sold almost 90% of Delahaye production overseas, as they needed to do, they only built hundreds of these cars rather than thousands, which is what they needed to do to stay in business. By 1954, they had merged with Hotchkiss, and by 1956, the brand was gone completely. One of the greatest and earliest brands in automotive history, a mere memory. But the memories that Delahaye left are indelible, and I'm glad that I'm here today driving this car to bring them back to life. Driving here 
along this beach road in the fog, these great martial lights piercing the gloom, much as they must have at the Le Mans 24 hours. It's really a testament to both great French design and technology. It was partly due to lights like the Marshall lights that cars like the Delahaye were able to do what they did in rallies. It won the Monte Carlo rally as well in 1937 and continued its success in major and minor events. It's also quite interesting about this particular car is that it, like most of the production, is fitted with a Kotal pre-selector gearbox. It's an electromagnetic uh, gearbox and it has this small quadrant here on the arm of the steering column and you select the gear, press the clutch, and it engages. I love pre-selected gearboxes. When they're set up well, they're an absolute dream and frankly, they should have captured the world. Uh, they were much better than the early automatic transmissions, which really robbed a lot of power and gate, took the edge off performance. Um, but frankly, they were complex and uh, more expensive than the eventual torque converter transmissions, which became the norm. But uh, you can sort of think of them as a very early uh, version of some of the double clutch pre-selected gearboxes we have today. And when you hit the gas, you can tell that this Delahaye is a race-inspired car. It's very eager, it wants to go, but in a very comfortable and, and measured way. It's not wild or raw. It's, it has finesse, which you'd expect from a French car, from a great Grand Routier. It must be said, however, that while the car has power and it's very smooth, even by the standards of 1938, 1939, and certainly by 1951, cars like the Alpha were much, much smoother and could deliver the power in a better way than this Delahaye could put it down. But nonetheless, it's still an enjoyable ride. And one which I think surprises most people who see this car and expect it to, I don't know, perhaps wallow or, or wander around. It's not that kind of car at all. Thinking about the fact that at Le Mans, when Delahaye won in 1938, in the years previous, Le Mans had been dominated by Bentley and Alfa Romeo, and a victory at Le Mans was something that was not only a source of great pride for any manufacturer, but especially for a French manufacturer. But it's interesting to compare the driving experience of this car to a 1930s Bentley, for instance, where everything is much more mechanical, much more immediate in the Bentley, or even in an Alpha for that matter. This car, in typical French fashion, wants to deliver the goods, but also wants to protect you from the environment just a bit. So you're not thrown around like you might be in a Bentley or an Alpha. It's very interesting that uh, the natural characteristics of cars came about largely due to the road surfaces. The road surfaces in France were typically not very smooth, and so French cars have a tendency to have very compliant suspensions. The compliance of the suspension combined with the softness of the seat give you a nice comfortable ride. but it also feels firm enough and you have enough confidence in the car that you can place it easily for cornering. And one of the things that I really like about driving cars of this era are the narrow tires because you feel everything that the car is doing at all times. Of course, the car feels every bit of the road as well. So you have to make sure that you guide it with a firm but light hand. Let the steering wheel dance in your hands just a bit as the car moves around. You don't have to react to everything that the steering wheel does because the car will go where you look and where you point it eventually. One reminder that uh, this is a car whose chassis was designed in the 1930s is the fact that it's got a lot of power. And uh, I always come back to uh, 
the old idea that the stop-go factor. Uh, from the time the car was invented, engineers worked very hard at making cars go faster. They didn't think about how to make them stop much until the mid-1950s. And you can tell on a car like this that it definitely has more go than stop. And especially for today's traffic, it's something to be considered. Back when this car was designed and first built in the 1930s, it wasn't an issue because there was re relatively little traffic on the road. By 1951, when this car was, was built, traffic had become more of an issue. And by the late 1950s, a car with these dynamic capabilities was really something that uh, would not inspire a great deal of confidence uh, in the driver. And it's a shame because you, you think about what Delahaye accomplished before World War II and what might have been. The Delahayes of the 1950s are some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And when you compare them with the 1930s cars, and especially that 1936 Delahaye 135 GP that is coming to the uh, Audrain Automobile Museum from the incredible collection of Peter and Merle Mullen and the Mullen Museum, it's really astonishing to get that kind of history all in one place. I know I love Italian cars, I love German cars, American cars, British cars, but there is something very, very special about a French car. And what a French car like this Delahaye brings to this wonderful story of from the racetrack to the opera is absolutely perfect. Because what greater racetrack could there be than the great street circuit of Le Mans? And I can just imagine pulling up to the Opera in Paris, the Palais Garnier, in this beautiful chaperon bodied Delahaye 135 Cabriolet. That is truly from the racetrack to the opera in speed and style. Hi, it's Donald with this week's Audrain Auto Museum Fun Fast Fact Quiz question. With our upcoming exhibition, From the Racetrack to the Opera, it's important to think of the famous phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. But who was the person who first coined this phrase? If you think you know the answer, please leave it in our comments below. If you're not sure, tune in for our next video to find out the answer. Thanks. If you like these videos, let your friends know. Subscribe, comment, share.